evening. This is Robin Pearson. I'm broadcasting from Bendigo Library. I'm the only person in the library at the moment. There's a great big empty space rattling around. Uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge that we're broadcasting tonight from Jaja Wurrung and Wurundjeri traditional lands. We pay our respects to elders past and present of both of these nations. It all happens in a single second. The perceived insult, the justification, the compulsion to sort someone out, teach them the lesson that they'll never forget. The rest is grief and tragedy. Tonight, we hear from award-winning author, Barry Dickens. He'll be discussing his recent work, One Punch, which is a study of random violence. One Punch was featured as the non-fiction pick of the week last week in The Age. Here's the title. It is available in the library. You'll have to reserve it. Hopefully when we reopen, you'll be able to come in and enjoy it. Barry, I'll come over to you. We, we read a lot about violence. We read about family violence. We read about violence against women, racial and homophobic violence. And what we read is often quite rightly uh, angry and like a call to arms, but one punch is a little bit different. What, when you wrote this, you wrote really softly. You wrote, you know, quite gently. Could you start talking about that? Well, I was thrilled that Stephen Carroll, who reviewed the book in the Spectrum last yeah. week uh, for the Sydney Morning Herald in the Age, that he said it was a meditation. He called it a meditation. That made me feel really very fine because I believe in prayer and I believe in quietude. And I wanted to write the book in a really unsensational way. And, and uh, I guess I, I, um, I was prepared, you know, for the, the sorts of shocks that I received when I did the interviews. But, but overall, I think the book is a peaceful book. It's a book about shocks, but it's written in a contemplative way. Almost a dreamy sort of way, like a reverie, where I've gone back and forward in time and remembered an idyllic childhood, a, a happy childhood that wasn't a pretentious happy childhood. It really was hardworking, honest parents who put their children first. And there's no hitting in our home. And uh, you knew right from wrong that we were never even when people lifted their arm as pantomime, as though to hit you. I mean, my father Len never did that, you know, acting as if he would hit you. Uh, it was all in his eyes. And you knew you knew the power and the glory were, were in his eyes. And in my mother's eyes too, because she, she was like Len, she never hit. But you didn't want to cross her and you wouldn't want to. So it was a very peaceful, hardworking, industrious home. My father was a printer, a machinist, a guillotine operator, and a typesetter. So I grew up loving typeset and what's called fonts now, and all the different letterings. Dad used to set the type out in the garage. And then later on, he had a small printing business in suburban reservoir, which is 10 miles, as the crow flies carrying a petrol can, as they used to say, from Melbourne. And so I grew up in a hardworking, honest, joy-filled house and the first time I saw violence was um, I was about six or seven and in the first chapter of my book it shows my elder brother John going over to the shops together it's Christmas morning we wanted to buy some of these new stick sort of chewy stewies that came in stick form and all the other kids were talking about so John and I were going to buy some chewies and and, uh, and then I saw, and John saw, a knife fight in the middle of our road. Two teenagers glaring at each other, one of them holding a, what looked to be a dagger or some sort of a knife. And John and I walked around them, and the bigger boy threw the, the knife or the dagger at the other boy. It stuck right between his eyes, stuck in his skull. And yet he didn't die. It was just... It was the most shocking thing to see, but that wasn't pantomime. That was, that was uh, you'd have to say it was like attempted murder. And then John and I speed out over to the shop 
thought that Joey's and John was about nine and I was about six. But I'll, I'll never forget seeing the, the arbitrariness of that. You know, it just happened. And that's sort of the precursor to the book. Mm. Though it happened so long ago, I was six. Now I'm 70, almost 71. I hope I don't look it. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm vain for an old bloke. But, but uh, in 67 years, I haven't forgotten the throwing of that dagger. I haven't, I'll never forget it. Barry, you weave the, uh, you weave the cases throughout your family story in the book. But, but what was it that, um, that inspired you to write the book in the first place? Well, I think watching television, um, watching Channel 9 News nearly every night, Channel 10, I've got favourite reporters and favourite editors or favourite staff who work. I've worked a lot in television myself. And it's like the press. You want to see who's writing, who's writing the best columns, and you can't help but be competitive. And then I've seen, you know, these one-punch stories on Channel 9, Channel 10, Channel 7, Channel 2, uh, where the parents really are struggling to say a word about what's happened. And they're, they're not forgotten, but they're sort of um, brushed aside. And uh, they haven't quite said what they want to say, which is the shocking truth of having their son murdered. And uh, um, the helplessness of that. And as I started to watch these cases on the different news services and on radio too, it's not just television, I thought these people deserve some space in which to speak and chapters that are not going to rush them through their thoughts. You know, what's it like to go to court? I mean, just not many people go to court or not many people do jury service. But the atmosphere of the magistrate's court, I've been a court reporter, Robin, and I've been a court reporter most of my life. For newspapers and for courts, I've been res a resident writer for different courts. At the Neighbourhood Justice Centre in Collingwood, I worked for two years as a court reporter. And as I watched these interviews, I thought, why can't they give the parents a chance to speak? Is it all, is it all in the editing? Can't they speak? You know, and there's no space to speak. So that was that was the sort of impetus. Yeah. And then one of the editors at uh, Hardy Grant, the publisher that, that publishes my books, um, I've published eight books with Hardy Grant. Um, he took me out to lunch one day and said, you know. You mightn't want this, but the board have decided to give you the chance to write a book of interviews with the parents and the sisters and brothers of people who have been murdered or killed in this one punch. Um, it used to be called the cow's punch, but in the legislature now it's called one punch. It's been amended from the cow's punch. That's sort of a euphemism. But the law is one punch. It's called the title uh, of that particular blow, one punch. You know, and, uh, so I agreed to, to do it. And then I met the families and listened to them eagerly and carefully. And then my, I married it to my own thoughts about the sort of, not mayhem, but the casual violence that I've seen all through my life where there's no prompting. There's no, there's no reason for it. It just comes like a flash of lightning. And I've seen, you know, the most havocsome treatment of innocent people on a train, on a tram, in a bus. Um, my young son, Louis, who's 25, was really badly bashed when I was um, listening to an interview on a tape. And he rang me from Melbourne Hospital to say he'd been bashed. So it really was close to the bone. You're writing about random violence, unprompted violence. All violence is immoral. And then your own son, you know, I love no one more than him. And then he's saying, oh, could you come and pick me up, Dad? I'm in triage at the Melbourne Hospital. And I've, I've been writing about this, uh, you know, people being bashed. And often to death, bashed to death in one punch. A one punch bash. Barry, would, could you talk a little bit about um, how to 
Caterina Politi yeah. and and the case, and then maybe talk a little bit about the interview. Yeah, well, I'm friendly with some of the senior police who still work, you know, and and I've written three books of interview with police, and and one of them was a minister for family violence, and um, that was his title, minister for family. But you can't believe it. that's that's the title, but that's that's what it was. And he used to be the head of the police union, and I had a cup of coffee with him, several cups of coffee at his office in Exhibition Street in the city, and he was friendly with Kat Katerina Politi. And I knew of the case, but hadn't studied it. And he, he said to me, this is where you start. You start with Katerina. And um, he told me what had happened. I knew what had happened, but not as sharply as he did. Mm. And, then, and then he rang Katerina and arranged, arranged for us to meet. And luckily for me, Katerina had read my uh, columns in the age and the Australian and she'd read some of my books too so and some of the published plays so that was a real advantage that she knew my style and then um, she wanted to meet me and I wanted to meet her and then the police minister arranged that date that date I went out to her home um, not really knowing where to go and then when I saw such a beautiful house that she's got since the death of her son, she's filled that cottage with the most beautiful flowers. The garden is full of, it's brimming full of, dripping with beautiful orchids and trumpet lilies and flowers. And that's, that's the sort of a tiny compensation, of course, to keep the house hopeful. And then she's taken up the cudgels and she goes out, Katerina does, and speaks at scout halls and schools and colleges and tapes about, you know, her message is to keep your hands to yourself. And if you're going to have a drink, have one drink. But, um, but both, both boys who were killed um, uh, certainly didn't expect it to happen. It was, um, one was 18, that was David Cassai. The father's name is Cassai, C-A-S-S-A-I. And then his name was not Politi. And then the other boy was 30, and he was killed after a football match in Greensboro. Um, and and um, so I interviewed two lots of families. And then also I interviewed, through the efforts of Kater Katerina, I interviewed a witness, a witness who saw the blow down at Rye. His name was Vassai, Vassai. And Katerina arranged for me to do the interview with him at the kitchen. So she facilitated that interview. And that was much harder to do really as a journalist because I thought that Vasai was an enormous boy. And, uh, I thought he was all right to talk and be interviewed, but he wasn't. He was really still in shock and he just wept through the whole interview. And, but he'd seen the blow delivered to his best friend and he wanted to talk. And I said, if it gets too hard, do you want to stop? And you know what he said? He said, I want to tell you every wrung out word. So in other words, he trusted me. He knew from Katerina that I could be you know, trusted and to store these stories up for the public in the right way, in a decent way, in an unsensational way, in a meditative way. So it is prayerful. It is like a prayer for our Earth family, you know, to love each other. So that's how I met Katerina, through the efforts of the police, the police minister. I couldn't have got to her threshold without him. He intended me to interview her and he intended the book to come out. So I'm lucky like that. Uh, when we spoke last week, Barry, you talked a little bit about your interviewing technique. Um, and, an, and an incident that happened when you worked for Channel 9 oh, and how it fed your, uh, and oh, fed your interview technique for the rest of your days. Would you um, like to share that? Would you like to share that? Oh, no, I would. It's, it's sort of embarrassing in a way, but, I mean, with all my faults, I'm a comedian as well as a dramatist and a moralist. Like a lot of entertainers, I'm highly moral and I can make some foolish mistakes. 
And years ago, I used to work for a current affair, and I was up in Dimboola, in Dimboola. What a pretty town that is, you know, right on the Dimboola River, interviewing an old Aboriginal man named Jack Kennedy. And it's very hard to get to old Aboriginal World War II people. Um, he was almost 90 then, even 87 or something. He was a rat of Tobruk. And um, somehow or other, Channel 9 got his number. And I got up there and most of it was done, the Vox Pop was done walking around the Dimboola River. And it was such a pretty day. And then we went back to his home, which was a fibrous plaster sort of hut on the edge of the Dimboola River. Now, I still remember he had the Aboriginal flag as a blind over the window, fluttering, an unmistakable, beautiful flag. And we were getting on really well, and we were chuckling and laughing. And, and then he told a really grievous story, a really heartfelt story about how racist the army had been when he was in Tobruk. He had his mates, but he suffered from racism. And then I made the great mistake of talking over him. I interrupted him. And then there's a guy called Peter Blinkensop, was the producer of The Current Affair. And I'd spoiled the interview, you know, without thinking. And he took me to one side and in front of the crew, in front of the lighting guy and the sound, the two sound guys, and there's about 10 on the crew, you know, they did really classy segments. And Peter said to me in front of them, to humiliate me, and he said, never ever interrupt our guests. Mr. Kennedy is not your guest. He's our guest. He's the guest of Channel 9. They're your employer, in case you've forgotten. And it was such a telling off. And uh, when I stepped over the threshold of Katarina's home, I remembered for some reason Peter Blenkinsop and that chastening moment where I, they edited the interview in such a way you couldn't tell that it had been interrupted. I mean, they're geniuses, those film people. But the moral imperative was not to ever interrupt someone as precious as he was, or anybody who really shouldn't interrupt an interview. But the adrenaline pumped and I, and I spoiled it. So I remembered that. And when I sat down with Mrs. Politi, I made sure I didn't ever go over what she was saying and I didn't so that was a really good lesson you know yeah, that's that's on the house to your, <laughs> to, your, to your viewers they can all have that we've all made that mistake I think talking over someone when it, you know, it can be disastrous because they've got your trust you know and you, you're dashing the trust so once I realised that I'm such a lucky guest at Mrs. Cat Mrs. Politi's house. There's no way I'll be interrupting her. And as well as that, in Reservoir, where I come from, there is a saying when you're emotionally full up that, you know, that guy looks so full up, full up, meaning you, you know, it's like a vessel full of water. You just thought that Mrs. Politi was bursting to talk. She had so much to say about the jury, about how it felt in court, even about how uncomfortable court was, how hard it is to get a park outside a courthouse here. The public wouldn't dream of that, but it is hard to get a park. And then, you know, you can be sat next to the person who killed your son. How are you going to get your thoughts when you're in the dock, if that happens, with him staring at you or smiling at you? So all this I wanted to capture for the, for the good of the book. So Barry, could you, could you talk a little bit about how that interview uh, fed, your, fed your writing? Did you, did you go into the book thinking it would be meditative, thinking it would be gentle, or, or did that come from from you know, the nature of the interviews with the, with the different... Well, as well as gentle, what Katerina was saying was full of force, but it wasn't rage. 
she, she was so contained. She, she, she was so eloquent. She knew exactly what to say to me, but it wasn't in any sense a lecture. It was sort of casual, which gave it more and more force. And um, she is a really good speaker, a brilliant speaker, a brilliant describer of, of what is indescribable. You know, the, the murder of your son. Um, I, where my friends used to ask me, you know, what are you working on? What are you working on, Dickens? You know, I'm known as Dickens in Melbourne. And I'd, I'd say a book on a book on children being killed because I want to know how the parents feel, you know, after the fact of that event. How do you how do you how do you get up and go to work? How do you how do you put the clock on and what's your favorite program? Everything's different. And I feel really lucky to have to have met both families. And, and Vassa, I just call her Vassa. Really lucky to admit them. And I knew it would be a good book because of the, the quality of the guests. They weren't hard to interview. They, they all wanted to talk a lot. You know, but it was distilled. They, had, they knew exactly, it's like a rehearsal, they knew exactly what to say. Not to me, but to the reader. Vis a vis the writing. So, yeah, I, I felt really good about the, the content or how they were talking. And um, um, there were really great quotes that I knew as a reporter would be good for the book. Um, um, the mother, Robin, Robin is the mother of the other family. She said that after her son was killed, she got into his doona to feel his body warmth. I mean, that's like being a mammal. That's the shock of a mammal, to feel the warmth of yourself. And one of the editors of Hardy Grant said, how did you get Robin to, to say that? And I said, I didn't, I didn't try anything. She was, that was the way she spoke. She felt free to talk in that way. So that's where it comes from. It's sort of, it comes from television and all the years I've worked in television. Channel 9, um, the current affair, all the programs that I've worked on. And Bert Newton, I've been on Bert's show. That was fun. Um, he's a good interviewer himself, Bert. You know? um, so that by six months in, Robin, I, I knew I had I had the goods. And then when I showed the manuscript to Hardy, they were really happy with that. There was a lot of tweaking and revision as there always is. But I had two really, a woman called Margaret Bowman was the editor, the copy editor. And people think that the writer does the whole book, but it's 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 polished by someone who is a grammarian, you know, every single syllable and where they should go. You know. So um, yeah, there I am. <laughs> Is it, was this book different to your usual writing style, Barry? I, you know, I know you're, yeah. you're a writer, yeah. so you write a lot for theatre as, as well as books. Uh, did, did you try anything new as a writer this time around? Yeah, it, it was new. It was a new mood. And, and, uh, and I've, I've suffered, like a lot of us have, I've suffered from depression. One of my Honey Grant books is about recovery from depression and anxiety, of which the two illnesses, I think, Anxiety is much worse than depression because you simply can't relax. You cannot relax when you're anxious. You can't drive the car, you can't do anything. You scold yourself knocking the tea on you because you can't, you're not actually watching the teacup. Your mind is racing, it's on something else. And that's, that's become a phenomenon, not just in Australia, but around the world that people are anxious. And with coronavirus, no wonder they're anxious. Mm -hmm. But then you've got to watch what you're doing as um, as uh, my guests have said, you know, as Katerina has said, you keep your hands to yourself, watch what you watch yourself. 
you better watch yourself. That's what she said with her, her statue. I haven't seen her give a talk, but I'd like to go. Um, uh, how was the book received uh, by the families involved, the people you interviewed? Yeah, no, good, good. And uh, Katerina was the first to get back to me. Her niece bought her a copy of Woolies. So I've never seen, I've never sold a book through Woolworths before. Woolies, that, I think it's Kat Katerina for birthday present. And she really liked it, not just her interview, but the tone of the book, the whole book. She didn't, she didn't flip through it. And then the other family were, um, yeah, happy, happy is the wrong word, but saw it as dutiful and fun. Um, I feel like writing a similar book now. I, I, I've got it in my mind to write another book like that. Um, Could you talk about that a little? Hmm? Could you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it's because because of death. I mean, I've never written about death before. And um, this is real death and real crime, not, not fiction. But about three months ago, I watched on the news, ABC or Channel 7, whichever it was, a story that really shocked me. And it shocked me as much as the first time I saw Katerina being interrupted on television and people just giving her a perfunctory interview, no, no time to let her speak. I mean, she's got to really rush her words. That was why I wanted to capture all of her words. You know? And then I saw this news story on one of the commercials, Channel 7 or Channel 9, and the, was, the story was of a, uh, a popular uh, high school um, headmistress who was cycling along a road at Black Rock, apparently it's a dangerous curve in the road, Black Rock, and then she got hit and run, she was killed. And nothing left of the bicycle, which was shown on television. They always do that, show you the crane bike. And then they showed a shot of her. She looked like a really, you know, decent, friendly person. Cycling home from school, and then the guy that hit her was about 30, and he had a child in the back of his car, and they fled the scene. And someone who saw it happen got the number plate, and within half an hour, the cops had him. But how could you flee the scene with a little child in the back of the car? So that court case will be coming up. And that's something I'd like to tackle as a book, and, and another book of interviews. And um, sympathetic interviews, sympathetic account. Um, but whether that could be a long way off, I mean, when the trial could be, could be another year or something. But the moral imperative is to get the truth of why that happened, particularly why you'd flee the scene after with a child in the back of the car. It's only a news story, but that's the sort of thing I want to write about. Yeah, but is it, are there similarities, Barry, with the random violence and the, you know, yeah. the random yeah. and, and run off? Oh, and how could you run off? How could you run off? How could you? That, that's that's my point. How could you? It, it, for, for, for both of these uh, these issues, the hit and run and the um, the one punch, is it is it the morality that you like to discuss? Is it the yeah? The, what's just? What's just? And what's unjust? And it is unjust to flee a scene like that. No matter how awful it would be to confront the police and the families, that's your moral duty. You've got to confront them. How could you live with yourself if you did that in, in the company of your daughter, little daughter? So as to the um, perpetrators of crime, I wanted to interview the mum, but because they were in jail, I couldn't. I wanted to see whether they were contrite and whether they showed contrition or they didn't. And then I've got Katrina, Katerina, I mean, her description of, of her son David's assailant. And there was no letter of contrition or nothing was said in the doc whereby he was sorry. 
similarly with the other man who killed the boy at Greensboro. Um, no, not a word of apology to the parents. And the parents expected an apology. And I did an interview once with some kids at Princess Hill High School because I teach just around the corner from there at a community centre. And one of the friendly English teachers arranged so the teenage kids from Princess Hill, which is in Carlton, to do an interview with me in the shelter shed. And she facilitated that interview. So I had kids of 12 talking about, you know, things like contrition. And they wanted to talk about that. That seen the unfair side of fights. They'd been in them. And I asked some of them, you know, would you expect a letter of contrition if you were a parent? It wouldn't come, said one of them. And when I asked my son Louis whether there would be contrition from the two boys that beat him so savagely, he said he didn't expect it. So that's a bleak thing, isn't it, to not expect it? Because I grew up in a sort of, it wasn't Christian, the neighbourhood, but it was a just neighbourhood where if you did wrong, you had to, um, you had to come forth and you had to say what you'd done wrong. It's true playing junior football. If you did something terrible and knocked someone out, you had to say how that felt, how guilty you felt. Um, take it to task. But it surprised me when my son Louis said, I, I wouldn't expect a letter of contrition from the two boys that beat him. And they beat him to a point where he was unconscious. He asked them if they were going to kill him. That's how savage the blows were. And I took him to Carlton and bought him some dinner and some orange juice. He really wanted the orange juice because his lips were so swollen from the, from the punches. In my memory, I can still see his bottom lip with the sort of water blisters on the bottom lip from, you know, repetitive punches left and right hand over and over and over. He said, you're going to kill me because he's so little and they were enormous. So what a thing, you know, to go through. He didn't want any self-pity. He didn't want any... He wasn't sorry. He just wanted to get on with things. So I've interviewed everyone in the community. There's um, Roman Catholic priest. Um, there's... Everyone in the community has had a say about one punch. And I haven't heard of, of it again since um, last year. I haven't heard of... Have you heard whether there's been cases of one punch? No, not that I've not that I've seen. But do you think that random violence, not necessarily just one punch, but do you think random violence is on a rise, or is I, it just reported more? Well, I think that people swear uh, all the time. Well, they swear differently from when I was a teenager. I mean, the most the violent thing I ever seen was drat, drat. Oh, drat. You know, that was as obscene as I thought. You weren't allowed to swear enough. And I didn't want to swear. I still never swear. Drat. You know, that's a very shocking thing to say. But I, I see people, you know, swearing in traffic, people threatening each other in traffic. Now, I've been threatened several times in my own street by people who are furious that I'm in front of them. No, well, I can't help that. It's just the way it was with the traffic. But I have been really seriously shocked at some of the behaviour with road rage. Um, I don't know whether someone performing road rage has killed someone else, but it's as though they are going to. And it's uh, this slight, you know, you've got in front of me. You, you ordered something. You ordered a Big Mac to call me. You... You know, I'm going to kill you for that. What? You know, but if this is the language you hear. Mm -hmm. the, the, not just the language, people intend harm on each other. I really believe we're here to love each other. That's the message. You know, I think most people are good. I don't think the book is depressing. I just think the book is it's refreshing because it's, it's so candid. 
So I want to continue with interviewing, and I've learned the golden rule, never interrupt. I've learned that. <laughs> and then getting quotes from children to go in the book. It's just, and getting Louis quotes, I say. Good. Barry, in the book, you, you interviewed a, um, a solicitor and, and some um, professionals around the court. Yeah. Uh, you know, as well as the families. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I was in court a few years ago. Um, I was charged with perjury. Um, I was writing for the age, and I wrote an article that lampooned a strip search. I'd been strip searched. I wrote the article, it's published in the Sunday Age. And then I was over the article, I was charged with perjury and had to go to court. And uh, I hadn't done anything wrong. And uh, one of my barristers is a guy called Simon Moody. Um, he works for Rob Sari, S A R Y. Rob Sari is a famous barrister. He's got a chambers in Queen Street. And Simon Moody drew my case, and he and another barrister defended me. And uh, they really fought hard. And in the end, the perjury charge was dropped. But it was a great shock to go to court. And I've been a court reporter. And, uh, I haven't done anything wrong. And, uh, but it was because I said that I'd been strip searched that I was charged with perjury. And I was. I mean, anyway, that was it. Um, you can't beat the police in court. And uh, you can't beat them anyway. And I, I'm someone who's loved the police, written books of interview with. Um, so Simon Moody uh, has come into my mind. Uh, He's not my friend, but he's an acquaintance that I really care about. And, uh, so I interviewed Simon for the book. And he'd seen me in the dock as a criminal. And uh, so he likes my books, as Katarina did. So Simon Moody, I went to his home at his invitation, did an interview with him. That was great. He was talking about how, how society had changed since he was a youth. Um, and there's some nice anecdotes about that. So I was lucky to get a slice of everyone's opinion. Mm -hmm. you know, Roman Catholic priest, a priest named Simon Granger. He's seen in Preston, which is next to Residue, he's seen people bashed. He's seen that. He wanted to talk about how that felt. So there's everyone in the society is having a say. What was Simon's perspective on the random violence, Barry? He said that he, he notices things in detail. Being a barrister, you do notice it. Though. Just people pushing and shoving on the tram. He noticed that when he was 14 or 15, the young people stood up for the old people. They stood up and gave him a seat. And he instanced various cases where people pushed and shoved on the train. Rough handling of our senior citizens. You know, just rough, treating people roughly. And impatience, he talked a lot about that. People blowing up over nothing. Being annoyed in a post office because someone's buying stamps ahead of you. It's funny, isn't it, that they would, but they do. The impatience is a real problem. You can't be faster than you are. So he was just giving me a general picture of how the tenor of the times has re really changed. Barry, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the doctor that... Uh, died from a one punch in, in a one punch. Oh, yes. Well, he was. I didn't interview his widow, I wanted to, um, but the book was getting typeset at that stage. But out at Box Hill, there was a, a tall, friendly looking doctor who saw a young guy smoking, I think it was in the car park or near reception when you come out of reception. And he went over across to him, this young guy. And he said, excuse me, would you mind not smoking? And there are plenty of signs saying we're smoking at the hospital. 
and the guy killed him. He killed him for that. Straight right hand to the ear, killed him. He was dead when he hit the footpath. It's hard to believe, isn't it? It sounds like I've just made that up, but it's now a famous case. Oh man, you know, he just said, could you please not smoke? He wasn't aggressive. He's a shy, friendly doctor. Yeah, if we can um, think a little bit about, again, about David um, and how David was just out on a night out with mates. Yeah, he was walking. And his assailant. He, he was heading off yeah. on New Year's Eve a few years ago, school holiday. Like he was 17 or 18 or so. So I guess he's in year 12 or maybe he left school. I'm not sure if that was. But however, he was with his schoolmates and they were going to the carnival at Raleigh on the beach. There's a New Year's Eve carnival. You know, the, the, what's it called? The Ferris wheel and all that stuff and music. And kids go there to have a party on New Year's Eve. So David Cassidy and his mates were heading down there to, um, to Rome, to the beach. And then they were walking through the, the under scrub or what it was called, tea tree scrub, um, in a party mood. When this, uh, you know, gang of kids came at them, sort of mock boxing, mock shaping up, you know, what looked to be a playful sort of funny. Come on, we'll have you. Come on, we'll jokey, jokey, punchy. And then David Cassai with Katarina Tommy was the, he put up his hands to say, no contest, no contest. And then he turned his back on them and walked away chuckling like with the relief that nothing was going to happen. And then the man that punched him gave him a blow to the back of the ear that hemorrhaged his brain. And down he went on the tea tree scrub on the sand. You can imagine the pandemonium of the, the small group. And in the end, they got an ambulance, they got a chopper. They took him to um, the Alfred. And Katerina watched the helicopter come in and land on the helipad, bearing her son. And he's going down to ride him. So have a holiday, and then that's what she says. And then he wasn't in there long, not long at all. And then the three doctors walked towards her. Katerina said to me, that if one doctor walks towards you, you think there's a hope. But when three walk towards you, you know it's bad news. That's what she said. And, uh, and they said that he wouldn't recover from that punch that hemorrhaged his brain, that everything had bled inside him. And then, I don't know how long the duration was, but after some time, they made the decision to turn him off. Oh, woman. You can imagine, he's gone down to have some fun at the beach with his mates. So then Katerina, 18 months later, arranged for a boy named Basson, who was there, who saw the punch administered, and I interviewed him. I've never seen a, a human being weep as hard as he did. And then he said, oh, I want to give you every wrung out word. And it made me feel good in a way because, because he trusted me to write down exactly what he said, not to change exactly what he said. That's why the book is rare, because it's 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 not fiddled with. It's exactly as people have spoken. So um, you weave your your family story and your your childhood in and out of the conversations with. Yeah. Me. Uh, can you talk a little bit about about that? Well, I remember once, and it's in the book, being punched myself, because Len and Ed, my parents, never hit four sons. It's John is the oldest, Barry is second, Chris and Rob. The four sons were never slapped, hit, pushed, never abjured, never insulted. They never insulted their children. And um, 
I'm sorry, I've drifted a bit. What, what did you ask? I was asking you about how you how you weave your family you story. Oh, yes. Well, this, yeah. this yeah. relates to, uh, I was thinking of Katarina. Uh, this relates to high school. There's a story, an anecdote in the book, where a boy named Alan Fielding, who was a much bigger boy than me, had said to me and promised me I could wear his footy shorts. We were playing another school, and I was a little kid on the wing or something. I was 12. So Alan Fielding had promised me a lend of his spare shorts. And we're at the Oval, it's the Oval near the school. We're going to play Willers or some other team. And I'm in our school team. I thought I was, and then he decided not to give me the shorts. And I said, you promised. He said, so what? You said you'd lend me the shorts. I can't play them in. He said, right. Like that. And then I must have shown fists of anger. I didn't know how to box. I still don't know. I don't ever want to know how to box. And then he stepped in and saw his chance and gave me a straight right hand right to the mouth. Like with a man's fist. He was, Alan Fielding was so big. He would have been six foot one or something. A straight right hand right to the mouth. He chipped the top tooth. I loved that tooth. And the blood came onto my lips. I was drinking my own blood. And I ran home crying like anything. And my dad, Len, was working in the garage printing. He had a printing business in our garage. Two or three printing machines. Chickity, chickity, chickity. It was the sound we grew up there. Letter press printing. And had his grey dust coat on. And I, I ran to him. I was only 12. And he said, what's happened? What's all this blood? What's happened? I said, Alan Fielding whacked me and whacked me, Dad. And then he, Dad washed my face under the gully trap, the tap that he had near the, near the printing sheet. He said, I'll show you one thing that's invaluable. Stop that crying. Turn, turn off those waterworks. He said. And then he showed me how to block, but he mimed hitting me. And then your left hand blocks. You block. You block. It's called a block. So that the fist comes towards you, you allow it to come towards you, but before it hits you, you block it. And that lifts the opponent's arm up, and then in you go. In you go. It's a it's count of blood, you know, to block. And I've never used this great advice, but mm -hmm. I've, never, I've never hit anyone in my life. Yeah. But that was a great tip, to block. And then I went back to school. He said, don't salt. Don't salt. If you stay home with your mother, like a baby, they'll all laugh at you tomorrow. What you have to do is, is run up to school again and play with them. Show them you've got a bit of style. And that includes Alan Fielding. You kicked the football to him. I didn't do that, but that, I would have been a Christian if I had it. <laughs> but that story's in there for a good reason. It's the first time that I've felt a punch. I mean, not on the screen, not on the movies, but not on the teeth. <laughs> Barry, when we spoke last week, you talked a little bit about how you know, your dad was a printer printing from home, but he was also a reader. A huge reader. Yeah, uh, and you know, we've, we've got about 10 more minutes. Oh, I'd good. Like to, yep, I'd like you to have a little chat about, about how important that, that reading to you as a child and reading... Well, to begin with, my father was a typesetter, so he set the cold metal type on the kitchen table after we cleared away, and and all the sons cleared away. And I like washing the dishes. I've always liked washing the dishes. Get the table nice and clean. Dad had put newspapers down on the kitchen table, which is a laminate table, and he'd get a metal frame out and set the next day's work on that frame. And there were little bolts that you tightened. He tightened the font that was cold metal. And that plate would take him two hours to set that. And he'd have the copy, then you what it was going to look like. And he'd be writing down what type set, what size. That was called M's, how many M's, like a design of the job. And then he'd wrap that up at the end of at 8.30 or something. 
And then he called John and I into the um, where the fireplace was, and that was reading time. And he'd, he'd relax and read us things. And uh, so John would be about 11, I'd be about eight, and Dad would read to us by the fire. The Coral Island by R. N. Valentine, doing all the pirate voices, doing the swish of the ocean. We knew it was just Dad doing the sea, but it you allowed your imagination to, to play the sea and then you do creaking with boats, ropes and so it's like a little radio thing. And this is what, after he'd worked for 10 or 12 hours at the printing factory, he loved his children. He's a really good father. And sometimes he'd read to us out of the bungalow and then rare rabbits from it. <laughs> the magic pudding, doing all the voices. Like he'd read for about half an hour until we were asleep. With the most incredible range of sound effects that he produced. Bong, bong, the rare rabbit. He even made up words, like he boined the ball into the wall. There's no such word as boined, but Dad felt like they're being boined. And, uh, when I was little, when I was in form one, just to show how amusing, I came home from my first day at high school, which was Maryland, which is in Melbourne North. And I really didn't like the school. I thought, what a gloomy place. And I came home to my parents' place in Reservoir, about two miles, and um, through the volcanic topsoil and prickles. And I couldn't believe it, but in our front garden where I was born and where I grew up was a Mexican, a Mexican sitting in the bromeliads. And I thought, what's the Mexican doing there? And it was Len, it was my aunt, with the Mexicans from Brown and I. You know how in the cartoons, Mexicans sort of squat? But to have their siest. He'd come home early from the printing factory dressed up as a Mexican with a plastic clip on his arms and a sombrero, pretending he was asleep with his arms folded. And I walked across to him and he lifted up the sombrero. He would have been about 40. And he said, She. Sí. Like, because Mexicans are supposed to say, She. Sí. And they pretended to be asleep again. What a, this is the clown in the farm. This is the guy who's tired of working and wants to have some fun with the kids. And what a generous thing to do. It's like the Johnny Cash line. I, I'll admit that I'm a fool for you. You know, to be a fool for someone is a, a noble calling. So I was lucky, Robert, to come from such a happy home, happy house, and had so much kidding and joking. Singing, my mother was a great singer. Uh, she was as funny as my father. But they were highly moral too. He couldn't insult someone, he couldn't hurt someone. So that was great. They weren't Christian, but they believed that you should not hurt anyone, mentally or physically. And if you did, you must pay the dividend. You've got to, you've got to square it. Terribly hard to confront people you've sinned against and you've got to, like the guy that fled the scene with the school principal. I guess that's why I was interested in the story, as well as feeling so sorry for the lady. It's the, you know, the fact that he just took off. So whether that happens as a book or not, that's something I'd like to pursue. It would take probably three years to do that. And, mm -hmm. and this book, Hard Punch, One Punch has taken me nearly three years. It's worth it though, it's worth it. Mm. It's, um, it, has, it has a quietness and a gentleness that, that tells the story, as I, as I said at the beginning, that it tells the story without, without posing a solution. Yes, and that's, uh, without it's... without being strident, without without it being a call to arms, it just tells the story as the story was. That's very nice of you to say. But as one of my students once said at a country school, Robin, I taught a lot. At, uh, I taught at Maroona Primary School, 
Haroni, Abney Haroni, and taught cartoon drawing and poetry. And one of the kids one day at Marina State School was talking about being lectured to, he was. And he said, let's face it, Mr. Dickens, who needs another lecture? I thought, that's right, who needs another lecture? Because you get browbeaten. You can't think for yourself if you're lectured. But there is a way to communicate that's not a lecture. And I'm trying to take the best of the high school and state school teachers that, that I remember vividly. And what made them such brilliant teachers was how well they listened. You know, not play acting, really listening. They could remember what you said years later. You know. Decades later. Yeah. So you're teaching now as well, aren't you, Barry? Yeah, I'm teaching online from my home. So if any, of your, any, of, your, any of your viewers want some creative writing teaching, please pass on my email. <laughs> um, I've got about 20 in the group, and they're writing plays, poems, short stories, memoir, and then they send me their work and I critique it, always with encouragement. Um, one guy sent me a, a lot of work the other day. He'd been for a bike ride. Have you heard of um, the Kiwa Valley? Yes, I actually was born in Aubrey with so yeah, I when? know the Kiwa Valley. Yeah, I know the Kiwa Valley well. <laughs> Well, this guy's named John Harlan, and he wrote, he's over 70, and he's one of my best students. He wrote a brilliant essay on going camping up there, but the, the weather turned around. And um, he started off with the bike and all that. And then they were just flooded out in snow. Lucky to survive, but beautiful capture, you know, great. Beautiful part of the world. <laughs> yeah, is it? Where is it near? Yeah. Sorry? Near Where? Wadonga. Right. Yeah. This isn't long ago that he went up there and yeah. wrote an essay about what happened. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. You couldn't invent that. You couldn't make that up. And did you camp there? Did you did you camp there in the tent? No, it's just close to where I grew up. Oh, wow, it's pretty, is it? Pretty. Yeah, very, very pretty. Dairy country. Oh, I want to go there. Isn't it hard to stay at home? It's so hard to stay at home. At the moment, yes. Uh, so, Barry, we, we've just about reached the end of our time. Um, for the people who are who are watching or will watch this as a YouTube clip later, anything you want to wrap up with? I'd like to suggest that writing as a palliative, that writing can only do you good. And when people say, oh, I'm so bored, I'm bored. I think writing more than reading is the way through to joy. It's a rhapsodic thing to do. And anyone can buy an exercise book and file it. You don't have to write on a computer. You can write various drafts in an exercise book for 70 cents. So I say take up the cudgel and write everything you can remember, everything you can't remember. <laughs> like make it a dream. It doesn't have to be true. But having taught all my life since I was 20, I think that writing still gives me more pleasure than anything else. And it's free. So that's my tip. Write. Just write. And enjoy. You really enjoy. And then, and then read it back to yourself or back to your friends. Form a little writing club. It doesn't cost anything. So that's my being preachy. I want everyone who watches this to write. <laughs> Swashbuckler, fairy story, whatever, Mother Goose, get to it. <laughs> well, Barry, we'll wind it up with that, with that fabulous line, get to it. Um, okay, get I, to it. it <laughs> you know, I, thank you so much for, um, All right. for sharing your thoughts and your book with us. Um, as I've said, we, we do have copies for the library. Unfortunately, okay. people can't access them at the moment, but they can reserve them. Um, and it is available at Dimex. I bought my copy from um, from Dimex. Well, when I meet you, I'll sign it for you. <laughs> it's fabulous. And it seems it's also available at Woolworths. At Woolies. Yeah. Yes. It's first. Um, so, Barry, we'll wind it up. Um, thank you. Have a lovely evening. Thank and, you. Um,
we look forward to when the world gets back to normal and we can have live visits again to having you up to Bendigo again. Well, please say hello to Tammy because I most certainly Tam will. Tammy's been great to me. She's given me so many chances and organised uh, talks at Castle Main Library too. They're hard to get those talks and Tammy's really been great to me. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Barry. See Cheers. you later. <laughs> See you later, mate. Okay.